Now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Anil K. Gupta. Dr. Gupta is the Michael Dingman Chair in Strategy, Globalization, and Entrepreneurship at the Robert H. Smith School of Business at the University of Maryland College Park. He is ranked by Thinkers 50 as one of the world's most influential living management thinkers and has been named by The Economist as a superstar for research on emerging economies. A member of the World Economic Forum's Global Expert Network, he is the author of several influential books, including The Quest for Global Dominance, Getting China and India Right, and The Silk Road Rediscovered. Dr. Gupta is also a celebrated professor and has earned many teaching awards. I want to personally thank him for his support of this important webinar series. Dr. Gupta, next slide, please. Yeah, I uh, think we are there. Can you see? Yes, thank you. We just have one quick um, logistical announcement here. Before Dr. Gupta begins, I wanna ask everyone to please keep your microphones on mute to reduce any background noise. Dr. Gupta will be presenting his material in two parts today. Each module will consist of a 12 minute presentation and a 10 minute question and answer period. Please post your questions in the chat area and Dr. Gupta and I will address them thematically during the question and answer time. It will be important just to have questions posted in the chat area so that we can make sure that we get to everyone's questions and see them easily. Okay, we're ready to go. Dr. Gupta, I am going to hand it over to you. Thank you again. Thank you very much, Chris, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to everybody, uh, all my friends. The, um, so let's uh, look at, you know, the, uh, so I'm not going to focus on what's happening right now, uh, because it's very uncertain, but really, uh, you know, once, uh, let's say we are beyond uh, COVID-19, uh, then what the new normal will be like. Uh, and of course, you know, yesterday, uh, the reach to the nation, and uh, it was almost like comparing the current situation, the pandemic, uh, to the Second World War. So it's obviously uh, a major, major event of global consequence. And if you look at other major events and how society, uh, the, 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 uh, and, and society in every which way, uh, whether it's the economists, uh, the regulators, the policymakers have responded, uh, that after the Great Depression in the U.S., uh, that's when the Securities and Exchange Commission, the accounting standards, all of those were established uh, to actually regulate uh, the uh, securities market. After the Second World War, we had the founding of the United Nations, the World Bank, the IMF, uh, to reduce the likelihood of future global wars, but also to take care of the economic uh, <clears throat> fallout of major events. Uh, if we move forward, look at the dot-com bubble, uh, the bursting in 2000, uh, that led uh, in the US, for instance, to the uh, setting up of the Sarbanes-Oxley uh, uh, regulation, Sarbanes-Oxley Act. Uh, the great financial crisis, 2008-2009, uh, uh, led to the dot Frank. Uh, in the U.S., so therefore, you know, every major event uh, leads to some uh, new normal uh, in terms of how to deal with what we just witnessed and how to move forward. So, so I look at <clears throat> the current situation. Obviously, uh, given the uh, the time that we have, uh, so I uh, chose to focus on four uh, uh, issues, uh, four let's say dimensions. One is a global economic growth. Second is the future of globalization. Uh, third is the future of capitalism, how it might be affected. Uh, and again, with a certain bias, if you will, that while I look at the global situation, uh, also there's a little bit of a bias in terms of looking at the US. Uh, uh, so far still, you know, the largest economy in the world. And the fourth uh, is the future of pandemics, uh, in fact. Um, so let's look at the first one, the uh, future of economic growth. So if we uh, take a 20-year uh, perspective, uh, that the, so we are currently, at least over the last 10 years, or even our, over the last 20 years, we have been in somewhat of a slowdown. Because if you look at uh, the previous decade, uh, 2000 to 2009, 2010, not counting obviously the major dip uh, in 2008, 2009, that we were running at about three, four percent, some you know, often in fact ahead of four percent uh, global growth. Over the last ten years, we we have been in a slow but steady decline, and we are currently at uh, currently meaning 2019 at a 2.4 percent 
uh, worldwide economic growth rate. But then if you look at what the current predictions are, and obviously we have to take these, uh, 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 you know, we have to apply the lens of uh, that huge uncertainties, uh, but actually the, the predictions right now from the major investment banks uh, are not particularly good. Going, you know, even in fact, Nomura says that the, the world may see a 4% uh, debt. The, and so that's a uh, major, and some say actually, uh, maybe in fact, the situation could be even more dire. We have to see, and if you compare that to the, uh, what happened in 2009, 2010, that was only a minus 1.7%. So clearly the current situation is uh, uh, significantly worse economically uh, than the 2008, 2009 crisis. So right now it's somewhere between that and let's say the uh, the Great Depression of uh, 2029 to 2033. Then if you look at uh, in the U.S., for instance, unemployment rate, uh, it's obviously trending up, uh, and we have to see what happens. Uh, but the picture, in fact, uh, you know, most uh, predictions are that the unemployment rate in the U.S. in the second quarter will definitely be in double digits, more than uh, 10%. Uh, so now how does that compare to uh, the Great Depression? Uh, in the Great Depression in 1933, it was 24.9%. Uh, could it get so bad? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, and also, of course, uh, the economic uh, uh, policies uh, that uh, globally uh, policymakers are implementing, they're significantly wiser uh, than the situation was in uh, 1929. People have learned. People also have learned from the uh, 2008 crisis. And so that's why we see massive stimulus everywhere in the world uh, to minimize the economic fallout. So, you know, if we uh, look ahead, <clears throat> will the recovery be uh, V-shaped? I don't think so. Uh, it's more likely to be a U-shaped or <clears throat> uh, probably also not an L-shaped. And again, you know, the reason why it's more likely to be a U-shape, if you just look at, say, uh, the simulation for the UK, but the simulations uh, predictions for uh, US and other uh, uh, countries are roughly similar, uh, including China, is that we are likely, you know, we won't see the kind of peak that we are currently seeing, but we will continue to see uh, uh, small peaks uh, for actually, you know, right through next year until such time uh, as, uh, you know, medical science uh, helps us, uh, which is, you know, antibody tests, uh, infection tests, therapies, vaccines, obviously social behavior. Uh, so therefore the, you know, if I was to, uh, let's say, quote unquote, bet my money, I would bet on a U-shaped recovery uh, where 2020 will remain, uh, in fact, uh, dicey. Looking at the future of globalization, and if we take a long-term perspective, uh, then you see, you know, and uh, looking at the single biggest measure so far of uh, global integration, economic integration, we look at uh, merchandise trade. And if you look at the picture already for the, you know, it grew like crazy, uh, you know, for many decades, but already over the last 10 years, uh, trade, uh, worldwide trade to GDP uh, actually has been on a downward trend. So therefore the COVID-19 is going to just basically accelerate uh, the speed at which uh, uh, trade, uh, world trade, uh, merchandise trade has been declining. Uh, so it won't create it, but it would accelerate what has been going on. And why do we see this kind of a trend over the last uh, 10 years? Uh, is the end of the commodities boom, decline of oil prices, rising automation, shorter supply chains, and of course, rising wages in China, uh, but not just China, everywhere as emerging economies uh, grow and become, uh, let's say, less poor, uh, their wages grow. Uh, and so the wage differences between uh, emerging and developed economies begin to decline. The, uh, and then, so what's happening now, in a sense, the old globalization is dying, uh, which is the globalization uh, or integration by goods, physical goods. What we are in already, in fact, the new globalization. The new globalization is a digital uh, globalization. Uh, and already this is a story that's been playing out now for more than 10 years. And what COVID-19 does is accelerate that in every which way. Also, in, you know, in, a, in a sense, a good story is that according to McKinsey's analysis, 
uh, now in fact uh, connection connected by uh, digits uh, has a bigger impact on global GDP growth uh, than uh, connection uh, by physical goods. So in a sense, we should not, uh, uh, on a global basis, uh, be worried about uh, the death of the old globalization and embrace the new globalization, which just gets uh, speeded up uh, by COVID-19. And so, you know, if you look at this kind of story, again, you know, the physical globalization uh, that uh, comes down, uh, and what we have now is uh, actually digital globalization, and we can see, you know, expected impact of COVID-19 uh, on, um, you know, supply chains or shift away from China. You know, one thing that uh, definitely is going to happen uh, is that companies, uh, governments, uh, will not want to put all their eggs from a supply chain point of view in one basket, if you will, that kind of a heavy reliance on China. But it would lead to, uh, to some, uh, certainly for medical essentials, uh, domestic bias, regional bias, uh, you know, in North America, for North America kind of bias, uh, diversification of supply chain so that you're not dependent uh, on one uh, country primarily. And uh, uh, number one, you know, as part of that, because dependence on China has been extremely high shift away uh, from China. So, you know, as Bloomberg headline for it, not made in China is probably the next trend, certainly on the uh, tech sector side. So, you know, in fact, what we are likely to see is this kind of story. Globalization will be alive and well, uh, but what we will see is domestic production for domestic consumption, uh, or regional production for regional consumption, uh, rather than, uh, you know, growing physical uh, trade and physical goods. But what we will see is, in fact, given all the advances in technology, multinational companies will be alive and well, and they will thrive. Uh, but actually, uh, they will be uh, uh, sharing uh, digits, uh, designs, uh, blueprints uh, around the world, and there will be local production. So, so that's uh, the future. And actually, that future is a very bright future, if I was to say, looking ahead from 2030 and looking back at the new globalization, uh, we would be very happy. We, we would be very proud of this trend. So uh, maybe I will uh, stop at this point and see if there are any uh, questions that uh, uh, we could get into. Chris? Thank you, Anil. Are there any questions uh, at the moment? I think um, you did a great job explaining your new vision on digital globalization. So I think we all have a new definition for that. Um, here's one question I will present. If we're going to be in a WW economy driven by digits, that would imply that the WW economy is basically a services economy. Would you agree? The, well, I mean, uh, so yes. uh, the, uh, the answer is yes. And in fact, if we look at, uh, but with a uh, small, uh, let's say, clarification, which is a qualification, which is that if you look at uh, over the last 20 years, including the last 10, that while uh, uh, trade in physical goods has been uh, declining, uh, uh, you know, uh, standardized for world GDP. Uh, actually, uh, integration by services has been rising. But there are services uh, which are digital services that actually will get accelerated now. Uh, the, but there are services which are not digital. For example, travel. Uh, so, you know, so, so uh, or tourism, staying in hotels, uh, that kind of, that, that will take time because we have to see if, if, if in fact people around the world find that uh, a good vaccine has been developed and so therefore we are, we feel safe, we feel comfortable. I think uh, global travel will uh, definitely uh, return, uh, but we have to see what happens on the medical front. But digital services, absolutely. Thank you. Another question. Can you elaborate on the concept of digits that you presented a few minutes ago? The, so, uh, the, I mean, so when we talk about digits, uh, it's all types of uh, digits, you know. So, uh, you know, certainly uh, when we do this kind of a, a Zoom video session webinar, uh, that's um, uh, one kind of digit. Another kind of digit uh, is, uh, you know, certainly on the industrial side. And so this picture, uh, that I have here of a car, let's say, being manufactured uh, in a foreign location, 
and so what's really happening is not the movement of physical goods such as export and import of cars, but the movement of actually blueprints and designs. Uh, uh, so, you know, and of course, money, the movement of money. So it's really the new globalization is integration by capital, integration by uh, digits, uh, rather than physical goods. Thank you. Um, KPIs, uh, possible to maybe look in your crystal ball and think about what KPIs might be um, something that are going to be coming out of this new digital globalization. What, what, what would look like success? How would we measure success perhaps in this new world? Well, I mean, so I, I think success in the new world will, uh, you know, I mean, some of the KPIs, uh, let's say at the corporate level or what investors will be looking at, uh, you know, when they look at companies, uh, et cetera, you know, some of the basics uh, I don't think will uh, change, which is, you know, looking at you know, measures of cash flow, earnings, uh, market shares, uh, you know, revenues, all of those KPIs, I think, you know, they will never, never, never go away. But at the same time, I think uh, certain other KPIs uh, will come in. And already, if we look at uh, over the last, uh, you know, maybe five years, five plus years, ESG, you know, in, and, and that's, you know, which is looking at corporate behavior, corporate performance on the environment, on sustainability, on good governance. So ESG already has been a, a rising KPI and not just you know, in terms of uh, just talk, 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 but a, a KPI that investors are beginning to look at and companies which are uh, poor on ESG performance are now increasingly looked at as high risk and obviously investors discount a high risk. Uh, and so, but what COVID-19 uh, will definitely do is to even more uh, increase the importance of ESG uh, behavior by companies and if investors Look at that clearly, internal management of companies will factor in ESG more. So that's, uh, those are certainly some changes. Innovation, for example, gets accelerated. Uh, so looking at corporate behavior uh, from an innovation lens uh, and similarly then within companies, the importance of innovation because this kind of a disruption will radically say, you know, that uh, the old days uh, die faster and then, you know, so therefore we have to invent uh, the new models, uh, new technologies, new products at a faster pace. Yes, uh, innovation for sure. Um, I'm going to take one more question for you, Dr. Gupta, before we go into your second uh, module here this uh, today. Uh, last question is the impact to China um, as a world production center. Uh, might you spend a, a minute or so chatting about that? Yeah. So, you know, I mean, the China is the biggest production center in the world. Uh, you know, that's well known. Uh, and, you know, so the way I look at it is that if we look at the last, uh, you know, 40 years, say from 1980 onwards, the opening up uh, reforms in China, uh, that China has become uh, uh, a bigger and bigger manufacturing power. And along with that, of course, it has become uh, a massive export power. Uh, in the world, uh, certainly in terms of merchandise trade, uh, merchandise exports, it has become the biggest uh, export power in the world. That said, actually, it's, uh, you know, uh, if you look at, uh, you know, not over the last, uh, you know, five years when China has been slowing down, but if you look at the long story from 1980, that China's uh, economy grew at about 10 and a half percent annualized uh, in terms of real GDP growth. But of that 10 and a half percent annualized, uh, about maybe 2% or so uh, has been due to China's uh, growing role as an export power, export of physical goods. About 8% uh, of China's GDP growth were really production for domestic consumption. So therefore, even though we talk about China's growth as driven by exports, that's uh, not really, really true uh, because yes, uh, exports uh, played or physical goods played a, an, a very important role, but you know, in a massive way, all the infrastructure investment in China, you know, much of the domestic production in China, that was production for domestic consumption. And so if you look ahead for the next 10 years, and if we 
uh, assume, uh, as I was talking about, that not made in China or diversification away from China just gets accelerated by COVID-19, uh, that it's not going to make China any less of a manufacturing power. Uh, but uh, China's, let's say, manufacturing will increasingly, even more than the last 20 years, be production for domestic consumption. Uh, and so that's uh, how, now, of course, uh, another thing that will happen along with that is that as China, uh, Chinese economy continues to grow, uh, it's, going, it's already becoming more of a service driven economy uh, and less of a physical goods manufacturing economy. So two uh, major conclusions from that. Number one, uh, that the uh, China's uh, production of goods will be even more uh, over the next 10 years for domestic consumption rather than uh, for exports. Number two, even on the domestic side, China's economy will increasingly become a service driven rather than uh, manufacturing driven economy. Great, thank you so much for uh, entertaining those questions. I think we're ready for you to um, okay. hit the second module. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. So if you look at you know uh, capitalism and some of this, uh, uh, you know, I already alluded to a few minutes back. And so you know, if we look at what's been happening all over the world, uh, you know, it's uh, not uh, just China or U.S. or uh, Europe. I mean, or, you know, look at Brazil. That everywhere in the world, uh, the uh, uh, inequality uh, has been growing and has be been becoming very, very severe. And so, you know, and that's uh, really, we can say, uh, a direct outcome of capitalism uh, and or certainly uh, other trends connected to capitalism. So if you look at, you know, returns to capital, returns to knowledge, returns to labor, so as we have rising automation uh, and more knowledge intensity in the economy, in every sector of the economy, returns to physical labor uh, don't increase or maybe they even go down. Whereas the returns to knowledge work, uh, returns to, you know, so I mean, particularly knowledge work and of course returns to investment on capital, uh, to capital, they go up. And bulk of the population in any country uh, actually is, you know, work, physical work. Uh, and so, uh, so what happens as returns to labor go down or don't go increase and returns to knowledge and capital increase, uh, that means that uh, the, you know, top 1%, 5%, 10% uh, uh, affluent people in the country uh, they actually uh, become more affluent and capture bulk of the economic gains. So that's uh, a trend that's been happening. And uh, actually, you know, COVID-19 could worsen uh, that situation because uh, it's the people who have to go out and still work uh, uh, that expose themselves more uh, to the, uh, let's say, the, 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 the risks of getting infected. So, and, and so, so that's a trend that's been taking place. Now, but look at the other side of the story. That, and this is, uh, you know, actually already from the middle of last year, you know, long before uh, the COVID-19 was, uh, anybody was even dreaming about it, you know, perhaps except for Bill Gates, and I'll come to that in a minute. The, uh, and so you look at, uh, in the US, a business roundtable, you know, which is the body of all the CEOs of big companies, uh, that business roundtable already uh, talked explicitly that the purpose of the corporation is to promote an economy that serves all Americans. So moving away from a stock shareholder, uh, dominant role of shareholders in the economy to actually stakeholders. You look at uh, a statement by Jamie Dimon, um, uh, who chairs the business roundtable currently. He says the American dream is alive, uh, but framed. But you know, major employers investing in workers and communities because that's the only way to be successful over the long term. Uh, these modern principles, um, you know, and so it's essentially, the, you know, an economy that serves all Americans. Already, if you look at uh, how uh, in 2019, the middle of 2019, uh, the, all the corporate leaders they are beginning, you know, already talking about rethinking what capitalism means. Uh, 
And so, you know, and we look at uh, now all the stimulus and these are pictures from the US uh, that, uh, so, so that's, uh, you know, uh, accelerates uh, some trends that were already happening. So, you know, if you, if you look at the, how uh, capitalism, uh, you know, with looking a little more at the US in this uh, slide, is changing or actually what uh, a, a year from now we will find uh, a much greater acceptance of the government's role in the economy already that had been increasing uh, but you know it's uh, companies saying hey you know you stay away and let us do what we want to do uh, i think fundamentally that changes uh, embrace of industrial strategy you know uh, many countries china india uh, many in europe uh, they actually explicitly believe uh, in industrial strategy. Uh, U.S. has not. Uh, but if you look at today, uh, what's happening in terms of the uh, behavior of the U.S. Uh, government, White House, Congress, and not just President Trump, but you know, fundamentally uh, saying that the the government has a role uh, in thinking through, uh, you know, for instance, uh, supporting the airlines, uh, supporting Boeing. Uh, uh, and so that's an example of how supporting the banking sector. And, you know, so that's industrial strategy. I think uh, a year from now, uh, we will see uh, grudging perhaps, but a greater embrace of industrial strategy, government's role, a movement away from stockholder dominant capitalism to more of a stakeholder uh, based capitalism. Uh, again, in the US, uh, greater, uh, you know, it should say greater, not great, greater likelihood of universal health care. Uh, because, you know, if there's one thing that the COVID-19 situation does in the US uh, about the importance of covering everybody uh, in one, you know, so, so I think we will see that being accepted by both Democrats and Republicans. Uh, of course, the question of how do you get there uh, will be debated, but the fundamental goal, uh, I think, is likely to be accepted. Now, coming to the uh, the pandemics, you know, the uh, what can we say? Uh, how will society be different? How will the world be different on this issue because of what we are going through right now? Now, it's a, you know, here is an interesting uh, uh, look at things uh, that this Bill Gates, uh, who obviously is not a dummy, uh, in 2015, you know, he said in a TED talk, he said, today, the greatest risk of global catastrophe does not look like this. You know, that's obviously the Cold War, you know, after the Second World War and so on. He said, you know, look at this picture. This is from his TED talk in 2015 that the greatest risk of global catastrophe looks like the bottom picture. So this is something, uh, you know, in a sense, uh, is not unexpected. Uh, the, it's novel in terms of what kind of virus. And if you look at just, you know, uh, globally, the, you know, the, just over the last 20 years, uh, the kind of massive uh, uh, medical viral risks that the world has faced. Now, you know, COVID-19 is different in the sense that compared to SARS or H1N1, MERS, Ebola, uh, it is massive uh, and global, truly global. You know, Ebola did not fortunately become global. Uh, it got contained rapidly. Uh, similarly for MERS or H1N1 or even SARS. So COVID-19 in that sense uh, is a bigger uh, disruption on the, uh, the, 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 the medical side. And so what, you know, we uh, are uh, going to see uh, coming out of this situation is better prevention of, uh, you know, the viruses originating themselves. For example, uh, you know, close, closure of wildlife markets in China, much better monitoring and earlier predictions. So therefore, you know, anywhere in the corner of the world, uh, any type of a virus uh, that emerges uh, that affects human beings and is likely to become global, I think there would be greater monitoring and better prediction uh, as we come out of this. There would be fundamental advances uh, in virology uh, in terms of testing for viruses, in terms of you know, finding, uh, you know, uh, testing for immunity from the viruses, uh, 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 and in terms of obviously fundamental uh, finding therapies uh, for viruses. So you look at, you know, the uh, 
uh, AIDS, HIV AIDS, and some of the developments in biology uh, took place, uh, led in part uh, to, for instance, finding a pretty much a complete cure for hepatitis C, which was viewed as a major, major medical challenge uh, facing uh, people. The fundamental advances in vaccinology in terms of you know, how to create vaccines, but the speed, uh, you know, and, and obviously in terms of understanding the science uh, behind vaccines, I think that will see a fundamental advance and already you know, uh, more than 20 different types of efforts by companies are being made to develop uh, vaccines and develop them at a breakneck pace. And all of that will be fundamentally uh, uh, you know, good uh, for humanity and better preparedness. For instance, Nigeria you know, suffered badly uh, uh, because of Ebola. Uh, but in the current situation uh, with COVID-19, Nigeria actually has uh, you know, uh, been reported as being much better prepared, for instance, uh, than many other uh, countries in uh, Africa. So, you know, these are uh, things that we are likely to see. Uh, and, you know, I don't think I'm being overly optimistic uh, when I say that we can look ahead uh, to a, a better future in terms of the likely, because of COVID-19, the likelihood of a future pandemic anytime soon has dramatically gone down. Okay, and so, you know, going back to Bill Gates' uh, prediction that the next big catastrophe is likely to be a viral pandemic. Uh, I think we are seeing that right now, but what we are seeing right now and how uh, science is responding to it, how society, how governments are responding to it, uh, makes us, uh, makes the prediction actually a lot more optimistic for the future. So that's uh, how I see. Uh, Obviously, there are other topics that I uh, did not cover by design, just for sake of time. For instance, you know, on the digital front, uh, not just the digital globalization, but how industries get changed. Uh, so like the healthcare sector. And healthcare sector telemedicine has been relatively slow uh, to uh, kind of get accepted. And part of the reason why telemedicine has been relatively slow is because of privacy, you know, that uh, because if you are physically visiting a doctor, uh, you can assume perhaps uh, that your medical records will be private. Uh, but if you, uh, you know, see your doctor through telemedicine, uh, can you be sure? So therefore many governments uh, have put in, uh, let's say constraints on the growth of telemedicine. Fundamental change, you know, like, uh, you know, change in one year uh, uh, that's bigger on telemedicine, uh, than what people were anticipating would happen in 10 years uh, in terms of online education. Uh, uh, you know, and so obviously uh, that will uh, take, increase its market share. E-commerce, obviously. So therefore, many, many sectors of the economy you know, uh, will, from physical uh, to digital, those kinds of uh, developments. And you know, that means uh, naturally, uh, as an investor, if you will, if you look at companies, uh, companies that are riding the digital, uh, let's say, bull, digital dragon, are likely to perform better uh, and become bigger and faster, uh, bigger, become bigger at a faster pace. So now we could uh, maybe uh, see if uh, there are any questions uh, uh, that we might uh, like to, you know, kind of bull over. Yes, thank you. Uh, we do have a few questions. Let me start with the following. Uh, when the economy comes back to full power, do you think that the governments and businesses will rebuild supply chains and other infrastructure elements to be more green, more sustainable, or perhaps will um, everyone think they will focus on more near-term and governmental improvement will be set back a number of years? So it's kind of a sustainability question. Yeah, I think the, uh, you know, if we assume, which I do, so well, obviously, you know, uh, am I correct? We have to see, uh, but what I believe right now is that the, uh, you know, just the fundamental acceptance that shareholders by companies, uh, that shareholders are not the only stakeholders that matter, uh, that in fact, we have to think of uh, the community. So that shift already has been taking place, uh, but that gets more deeply ingrained and internalized and investors begin to look at it. 
And so what that is likely to mean is that even on the climate front, already, in fact, uh, you know, uh, uh, in terms of green, um, that all the companies uh, that uh, essentially help us uh, reduce the risks of global warming have to perform better. You know, so if I look at uh, in the US, uh, and this is before COVID-19, on CNBC, which is the dominant uh, business news channel, uh, and probably the single most influential anchor on CNBC is Jim Cramer. And Jim Cramer has been saying already for months uh, that you know, the world is moving away from oil, uh, from fossil fuels uh, to green. Uh, and all of that gets just accelerated because of what we are seeing right now. So I think uh, the, the, the society, governments, including the US, uh, will be uh, uh, a lot more, let's say, accepting of the need to focus on global warming. So, so, so I think that is, is good news as we come out of this situation. Yes, thank you. I'm gonna shift gears a little bit. Um, you had mentioned in a previous slide, stakeholder capitalism. Would you elaborate a little bit more on this concept? Yeah, so stakeholder capitalism, you know, it really means that uh, obviously does not uh, uh, mean that companies will, uh, you know, stop being of people uh, if and when they need to, uh, but that, and obviously if you lay off people, you are uh, making a trade off and you are saying that I need to protect my earnings and cash flow and reduce my cost and things like that. So, you know, that will happen. However, the one thing that will be different, or I mean, it's already moving in that direction, is that uh, companies, if you have to lay off people to figure out, in fact, how you can uh, reduce the blow uh, uh, to people, and, uh, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, investment in future training, uh, you know, for them, or, you know, how much, or let's say compensation uh, for their wages for how long after they are laid off or in fact uh, fired. So, you know, looking at the community, uh, what is the impact? And obviously a community, uh, impact on community means many things, but one of the things impact on community is really the environment. Uh, so I think the, uh, you know, over the last, uh, you know, 70, 80 years, a lot of companies, uh, we could say pretty much, you know, the vast majority, they have said, you know, to hell with the uh, uh, workers, to hell with uh, the community in terms of uh, impact on the environment. You know, we will just focus on maximizing uh, cash flows and earnings and so on. And so that uh, was the stockholder capitalism. You know, it's like uh, the uh, saying, attributed to Milton Friedman, but uh, I don't think he said it, is that the only goal uh, of companies is to uh, maximize profits. So that's, uh, you know, clearly already has been shifting uh, and more embrace, uh, greater embrace of uh, environmental sustainability and better governance, uh, looking at uh, the company and its impact more broadly. And already that's been happening, uh, but it just gets uh, speeded up. So that's what I mean by the shift to stakeholder capitalism. Very good, thank you. Um, yet another shift for you. Uh, we're changing, changing up. IP implications, intellectual property implications. Do you see any that um, you'd like to share your thoughts around given this pandemic? Yeah, so I mean, uh, of course, uh, I think any disruption speeds up the pace of innovation. Uh, and so, you know, if you just look at the half-life of uh, products, of, uh, you know, current products, uh, technologies, business models, the half-life has been declining. And already that's not a new trend, but it just uh, gets speeded up even more. And as innovation becomes more important, IP uh, becomes more important. And Clearly, we are not going to, uh, you know, want to be in a situation, and I don't think we'll be in a situation where IP is all, or always public goods rather than private goods owned, you know, that are belong to a company. No, I think uh, private ownership of IP, uh, that will remain alive and well. However, what we will see is one difference, and that's also something that uh, I will cover in the, uh, uh, the webinar third, 
which is how the innovation playbook is helping attack COVID-19, is that we will see, uh, already we are beginning to see, and we will see a lot more of it, is collaboration among companies. Uh, and so rather than solo focus on innovation, so open innovation, collaborative innovation, <clears throat> already has uh, gotten speeded up. And as that happens, clearly there will be sharing of ideas because you can't collaborate if you're not able, willing to uh, open up your kimono. Uh, and so we will see still uh, private ownership of IP remaining highly valued, but greater deliberate, uh, well, uh, let's say, managed sharing of IP uh, among companies as they engage in open innovation. Thank you, open innovation, I like it, new book. Um, last question for you, Dr. Gupta, uh, given our time, and his, this is probably a, a probably a good one, and perhaps could be its own uh, individual webinar. What kind of leadership is needed in this new digital global economy? What are the skills needed? What kind of leadership would you list as your priority? Yeah. So, I mean, you know, firstly, the uh, in the new global economy, uh, leaders. You know, some of the the aspects will be evergreen. And, uh, so, you know, partly, of course, I covered this, uh, you know, in the webinar number two, which is all about, in fact, uh, leadership under crisis, COVID-19 and other shocks. So, you know, what we will see is, uh, uh, you know, once again, the because like the current crisis, you know, it's a medical crisis. And so, uh, therefore, uh, the leadership uh, can't just include in terms of the senior team, only people who focus on operations or uh, finance, uh, but also people who are, uh, let's say, life science experts. So I think the need for uh, diversity in the top leadership team increases. Uh, and diversity doesn't have to mean that, uh, you know, uh, uh, let's say the a life sciences expert is a permanent member uh, of the leadership team, but certainly on and off as needed. Uh, part of the top leadership team, if you know, on an invited basis, perhaps. So I think we will see greater diversity uh, in uh, leadership, but we will also see, uh, for instance, COVID-19, uh, that for companies, protecting the workforce is job one. Uh, and second, of course, protecting the company's financial survival is job two. So which means that leadership uh, will focus a lot more uh, on the, you know, again, going back to the stakeholder idea on not just the finance and investor side, uh, cash flow side of the company, but also what's happening to workers, uh, what's happening to the community. So I think leadership, uh, 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 obviously, the importance uh, remains alive and well, becomes even more important. But the kinds of people, uh, executives who are likely to emerge as successful leaders uh, will change. Thank you, Anil. Thank you, Dr. Gupta. We really appreciate your time and support of this webinar series and look forward to seeing you. Uh, coming up here uh, three more times in the next uh, two weeks and folks should be able to see that slide here in front of us. Um, thank you all for joining us. The webinar you've attended here today has been recorded and we'll include the slides. We will let all attendees know when the recording is available so that you can review and share with colleagues and friends. And we look forward again to uh, hosting you on April 8th at 8.30 for Leadership Under Crisis, COVID-19 and Other Shocks. Uh, please keep checking back with us for more webinars and short courses and other learning opportunities from the Smith School of Business and Executive Education. We appreciate your time. We appreciate our alums and current students on the phone and our friends and partners. And again, Dr. Gupta, we appreciate your time and insights as always. Please thank stay you. safe. Yes, yeah. thank you. Yeah. yeah, thank you, Chris. And uh, thanks everybody for participating in this uh, webinar. And uh, yes, the, if there's only one thing I can say is stay safe. Uh, and of course, hope to see you on Wednesday. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Stay safe and go Terps. Mm -hmm.